news for this Friday. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. On Dateline's Friday. All right, it's Friday. So why don't we check in on how everyone's doing? Let's start with the Blazers. Okay, so not great. How about the school board in Albany? How much is that? How much is that? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm afraid to ask, but how about that Nicolas Cage pig movie filmed in Portland? How's that doing? Who has my pig? You know what? Let's just start the show, huh? Here's the story. Who has my Haggerty? You do. You got it. It's right here. Hi. Hello. This is the story. I'm Dan Haggerty. Thank you for being with us. As always, as always we're going to close out the week. It is a Friday. I got some Friday feelings. Uh, maybe you do too. Tell me what's on your mind. Use the hashtag HeyDan. All the ways to communicate with us at the bottom of your screen. Email us at the story at kgw.com. And I want to start tonight with some shocking news. Shock, just shocking, shocking stuff. Apparently, pig is good. Like really good, really, really good. And I'm not talking about bacon, I'm talking about Cage. That movie that Nicolas Cage shot here in Portland back in 2019, it debuts this weekend. You can go see it tonight, it's just out. There's, there's screenings running today already. And I'll be honest, I thought it was going to be horrible. First off, if you're just a casual Cage fan, let me, let me tell you something. Nicholas has been putting out way more movies than you think over the past few years, like almost 20 in tw from 2018 until now. Like in three years, he put out almost 20 movies. Just as a sample of some of the quality that he's been putting out, this is Jiu Jitsu, came out last year. The plot is, every six years, an ancient order of Jiu Jitsu fighters join forces to battle a vicious race of alien invaders. So look, I'm no Gene Siskel, but I didn't really have high hopes for Pig, which is a movie about a man who goes in search of his stolen truffle pig. I mean, just listen to the trailer. It seems insane. I'm looking for a truffle pig. Someone stole her. I don't understand. Who has my pig? Okay. You did probably notice, you saw, right? You should see Portland in the trailer. And it was, if you remember this, this was a while ago, but it was so fun when Nicolas Cage was in town. This was pre pandemic pre covid life was normal you remember that but people were posting pictures online when they spotted him out in town he was stopping into local businesses and rubbing elbows with some elected officials people like the uh, late city commissioner nick fish you see there in the photo or taking selfies with people at the airport it was great but no one thought pig was going to be like at the oscars right it wasn't going to be winning awards how wrong we were first of all the rotten tomato score is gangbusters Okay, it's that we're talking top tier cinema scores, 97% from the critics and in the 90s from the audience. To, to, to let you know what that means, it's not just some niche artsy film that only film majors can appreciate. The movie buffs like it and the average Joes like it. Variety said Nicolas Cage isn't just an actor, he's a state of mind. Huh? The Washington Post called it a strangely moving little film. And the New York Times said stunningly controlled, both moving and strange. And they named it as the critic's pick, moving and strange. That's us. That's Portland. How exciting. So go, get a ticket, check it out. Please, I'm interested. I want to hear what you have to say. Pig with the Portland backdrop. It's out right now. If you see it, let me know what you think about it. No spoilers, okay? And don't forget to use the hashtag, hey pig, or hey cage. No, hey Dan. That's it. All right, we've got to talk about the Blazers. If you're a fan, you probably woke up today, like all the other fans in town, having like a panic attack on Twitter. Um, if you're not a fan, let me loop you in on what's going on. See, the website True Hoop posted this story saying a source claimed Damian Lillard would request a trade in the coming days. Now, most fans know that this is a possibility. We know that he wants to win a championship and he hasn't been able to win a championship with the Blazers, but Portland loves this man, okay? So you can imagine this sparked a bit of chaos. Fortunately, Dame planned to address those rumors at a press conference for the Team USA basketball this afternoon. So let's get some clarity on this from the man himself. There's a lot of talk about, you know, 
trade rumors and, and reports that you've asked out. So you've talked about before right here that you want to talk for yourself. So uh, kind of your, where, where are you at right now in terms of, of, of that kind of stuff and those ideas that you have asked to be traded? His mic was muted. I love the pause too. Everybody's like holding their breath and his mic wasn't working uh, as if they needed any more suspense. But why don't we try it again? All right. What does Dame have to say about the rumors with the mic working? Number one is it's not true. Um, and secondly, it, I'll also say that I, I haven't made any firm decision on, you know, what my future will be. So he's not leaving yet. He could stay, but he might also go. I guess we'll have to wait and see. That's how these things work. In the meantime, we can talk about the other not-so-great Blazers story making the rounds. And I'm sure you remember the controversy over a few weeks ago when the Blazers named this man Chauncey Billups as their new head coach. He was a man accused of gang raping a woman in 1997. Police reports at the time say she went to the hospital, got a rape kit exam. Billups was not charged with a crime, but the woman sued him and later settled the two of them out of court three years later. Billups denies the allegations against him, admitting that they had a sexual encounter, but saying it was consensual. Blazers general manager Neil O'Shea says they took those allegations very seriously when they were doing this job search, and they conducted an independent investigation that found, quote, nothing non-consensual happened. But he wouldn't really say much more than that. You're just going to have to take our word that we hired an experienced firm that ran an investigation that gave us the results we've already discussed. Well, taking his word apparently was not a good enough answer for the journalists at OPB because they started doing some digging and published a report we think is worth your time. They discovered the investigator for the Blazers never contacted the woman who accused Billups. Her attorney told OPB it's news to us that they conducted an investigation. The investigator also didn't contact the former district attorney in Massachusetts, the person who oversaw the investigation back in 1997 and decided not to charge Billups. The former DA there told OPB that he believes Billups and quote said you and your colleague can continue to work this story until the cows come home but you will not be able to change the bottom line. By the way the investigator that the Blazers hired well the team has at this point cut ties with him after some people online found his Twitter account. Apparently he was retweeting some pretty sexually explicit stuff which is probably not the best look for someone investigating an alleged sexual assault. Let's move on and turn now to our big story. Over the past year or so, we've spent a lot of time talking about police transparency and accountability. And we have told you, and you know this probably well, Portland is the only major city in the country where officers don't wear body cameras while they're doing their job. Well, now it's as part of this ongoing back and forth between the Justice Department and Portland police. The feds say it's time to start wearing them. Here's Kyla Boshi. The U.S. Department of Justice is pushing Portland police to get body cams. It's one of several changes that Department of Justice lawyers want the city to make in order to satisfy a 2014 settlement agreement over police reform. The city should implement body-worn cameras for all officers. On Thursday, a civil rights attorney from the Department of Justice spoke with a community group and explained the value of body cams, illustrated by the June 24 shooting of Michael Ray Townsend at a North Portland motel. That right there is a case study in just how useful a body-worn camera system can be. Portland police officers didn't have body-worn cameras, but surveillance footage captured the deadly shooting and helped show the public, police, and the Department of Justice exactly what happened. But for the fortuitous nature of there having been a surveillance camera there, would we really know what happened with any sort of insurance? We would have different versions of events, but on the recording, you have solid data on which to rely. A KGW investigation earlier this year found of the top 75 big city police departments, Portland is the only agency that doesn't have body-worn cameras. Would you like to have body cams? We would. Our investigation found the city has explored police body cams for nearly a decade, but those efforts have been stymied by a lack of money and politics. The Bureau estimates it would cost roughly $2.9 million to get a body-worn camera program up and running with ongoing costs of about $1.8 a year. And in the past, there's been pushback. 
City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, an outspoken critic of body cameras, questioned whether they're effective. But this week, after being briefed by Department of Justice lawyers, Hardesty changed her tone and sounds open to the idea. In a statement, Hardesty said, I've been researching the issue and now believe there is new technology, policies, and additional best practices to draw from that can lead to a body camera program that produces better outcomes in policing. But the devil is in the details. The city is currently in private contract negotiations with the police union, and among the issues reportedly being hashed out, body cams. Portland officers say they want them, but have concerns about when and how the video will be released. Okay, so let's talk to Kyle Oboshi for just a moment. That last point in the piece there, Kyle, is that the only sticking point? No, not really. There's also a fair amount of debate over whether officers can view footage before writing those police reports. The U.S. Department of Justice recommends against that policy. Now, Joanne Hardesty, Commissioner Hardesty, mentioned new technology and best practices. What's changed? So in the discussions last night, Department of Justice lawyer mentioned privacy concerns. There are new programs that can easily blur faces if necessary in some of that video. Also, transparency has been a big debate for a long time. There have been improvements in public access, making these types of videos much easier for people to see. Got it. All right, Kyle Boshi, thank you. So how did we get here? In January of 2010, a Portland police officer shot and killed a man named Aaron Campbell while Campbell was having a mental health crisis. Portland's police commissioner at the time was Dan Saltzman, and he wrote to Senator Ron Wyden asking for Campbell's death to be investigated on a federal level. Wyden reached out to the Department of Justice. In the meantime, four other people with mental illnesses were killed by Portland police over a two-year period. We will be talking to people up and down the chain of command of the police force. In 2011, the DOJ announced they would start investigating Portland police's use of force and its pattern of killing people who have mental illnesses. The investigation took 18 months, and during that time, Portland police killed three people with mental illnesses. In September of 2012, investigators found that Portland police had deficiencies in policy, training, and officer accountability, and that they were acting unconstitutionally. The DOJ reached a settlement with the city, and the city agreed to address bureau policies around use of force, mental health crises, training, and accountability. Three years later, and the DOJ checked in, and they found the bureau was not fully complying with the agreement. In 2017, an amended settlement was reached, establishing a new community oversight group, ensuring officers who use deadly force are interviewed within 48 hours, and changing how data is collected and reported. Since the initial settlement was reached in 2012, at least 23 people with mental illnesses have been killed by Portland police. And that's how we got here. So here's a strange story. Earlier this week, someone spotted a downed plane in Southwest Washington and everybody freaked out. But it turns out it was just this guy's yard decorations. I never thought anything would like this would happen. We'll explain when the story continues.
Hey, welcome back, everybody. I always look through your questions and emails and tweets and all that stuff during the break. Keep them coming. Use that hashtag, Hey Dan. I got one from Lucky Squirrel saying, Pig, talking about that movie, Pig, saying it was truly amazing. Found it emotionally devastating and existentially taxing. Yikes. Now that's quite the review. I don't know if I'm in for that. I need to warm up first. Meanwhile, I'd like to tell you all about our Hey Help campaign. This week, we are asking you to consider donating to Friends of Trees. That's our Hey Help campaign this week, and they have done some great work planting thousands of trees in neighborhoods throughout Oregon and Southwest Washington. They've restored natural areas doing this work, and if you'd like to donate, please open up the camera on your phone, point it at the QR code on your screen. You can also go to kgw.com slash hey help. And once you're on the donation page, just select KGW in the drop down menu under the how did you hear about us question. So you know how we keep telling you that school board elections and school board races are important. Remember, we say it time and time again. Well, here's a good example why. In Albany, three brand new board members just elected, in just their second meeting actually, decided to up and fire the superintendent without much warning or without taking any public comment. All in favor <laughs> say aye. 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 Why? All against? No. I will abstain. Oh, Motion passed. You abstain? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn. Is there a second to adjourn? I have another motion. Don, I have another motion. Okay, everybody calm down. Here's what happened. All right, during the last election there, voters in that district, they picked three new people who ran on a more conservative type platform. You see, some of the people in the community were a little worried about some of the progressive moves being made in the district, like getting rid of police officers on campuses, for instance. So the new group that they just voted in decided it was time right off the bat to set the tone and fire the superintendent, which was a pretty dramatic move, of course. Really dramatic, actually. Let me explain. This is Melissa Goff, the soon-to-be former superintendent. And Goff has a contract. And the new guys on the board just fired her without cause, which they can do, of course, as long as they pay her a lot of money. So over the next 12, 12 months, she's going to get her $181,000 salary with benefits. Her last day, official day of work is next Friday before her tax-funded year-long paid vacation begins. Though it's probably more fair to assume that she may get a job before 12 months is up. She sent out a statement and said the board of directors asked me to not attend tonight's special session. When new school boards are elected, they sometimes choose to move in a different direction than the board they replace. This is one of those times. It is why no cause termination language is written into superintendent contracts, providing new boards the opportunity to hire a district leader aligned with their approach and their beliefs. Okay, she seems okay with it. She's gone. New person is coming in. They did it really quickly, too. I mean, again, that meeting was 22 minutes. It seemed very strategic because one of the first things they did, it's like a chess move. What are they going to do next? I'm sure they have something planned. Who are they going to pick? I'm setting up the next clip. I love this. See, as the meeting came to a close, as it was ending, the crowd was still yelling. The board of directors, they were still talking to each other and they were talking about the plans to now find the new interim and then permanent superintendent. And clearly, or at least it appears to be very clear that this is something that they have not talked about at all. I would like to move that we delegate authority to the chair and the vice chair to begin the search process for an interim superintendent and an acting superintendent. You're dividing us more. Bring I second. Can I speak to that motion? I would like to speak to that motion. I just want to make it clear. Actually, Mr. Tom, um, Director Thompson, I, I, I'm going to stop you. I would rather pass that, that privilege on to another board member. My schedule is very full and I'll be leaving. <laughs> So, so I, I, I withdraw the motion and I move we adjourn. Well, who's the new superintendent to adjourn tomorrow? has been moved and seconded by Director Wilson. A question Wilson. for the chair. All in okay. favor? I'm privileged to have a question. Who's Aye. the superintendent tomorrow? All opposed? The current superintendent is the superintendent tomorrow. Ten days. What? Ten days. Ten days. Eleven, Eleven days. days. Eleven days. Now you can't help but shake your head just a little bit at, at that. It's like the bank robbers running out of the bank and they both jump into the backseat of the getaway car like, I thought you were driving. I'm sure they'll find the right person. All right, and they better do it soon. 
There's a lot of work to be done. We're about to open schools for the first time fully in about a year and a half, and educators have no idea what to expect from the students or how far those students may have fallen behind over the past year and a half. Not to mention, most kids aren't vaccinated and can't be vaccinated, and the Delta variant continues to threaten the progress that we have made against this virus. Remember, school board elections are important. Now, I want to give you quickly just a little bit of a behind the scenes of what happens in our newsroom when we get some information about breaking news. On Monday, we heard there was a plane crash near Kalama in southwest Washington. Everyone started scrambling. Our assignment desk, they're on the phone. They're calling people. We launched Sky 8, the helicopter, up into the air. We were ready to send a crew to the scene, and we knew we heard that the Coast Guard had a search and rescue team already out there. Then we learned it was all just a decoration in some guy's yard. I mean, it did come from an actual plane crash at, at some point, but it was, it was a decoration. So we had Devin Haskins check it out for us. From the moment you step on a Gary Welter's property, you can see that he's got a wide collection of eclectic yard art, each piece with its own story to tell. They say art is in the eye of the beholder. Hey, this truck right here is eventually going to be a picnic table. What is one man's junk? Uh, this is half of a 1985 Corvette. Is another man's treasure. I cut the uh, side off of it, made a gate out of it. Behind each piece, the story of how it came to be. 56 Chevy. It was uh, either going to go to the dumper in my front yard. The rusted out cars or parts of them are all yard art in Gary Welter's mind. Yep, I see something that just, you know, kind of strikes me. And we do it. What Gary didn't know All right. was that one particular piece of yard art would cause quite a stir. Uh, it's come apart at the, right at the fuselage to the tail. The wrecked plane's tail was placed here three weeks ago. Chuck Ham is the co-owner. Gary said, what do you do with the tail section? What do you do with that wing? And I said, it's all going to scrap. It's not salvageable. And I told him about my great idea of putting it on the beach for yard art. And I said, you want it? Take it. It's not much, just an old burnt airplane tail. But it, too, has a story behind it. Well, this is my cousin George. Uh, this was taken in 1957 when he uh, got his lieutenant wings. Chuck and his cousin George Seasley co-owned the Piper Comanche twin-engine airplane. But the story of how it came to look like this took place on the evening of March 18th, 2020. The short version of it, uh, which is very unfortunate. Uh... Sheasley had taken off from an airport near Estacada, but something went wrong and he crashed just after takeoff. Neighbors pulled him from the burning wreckage. He survived, but had been seriously burned. You couldn't even recognize it as an airplane anymore. I mean, other than the wing and the tail section here, but the, the cockpit was just a big melted blob of plastic and aluminum. George passed away months later, which left the question of what to do with what was left of their airplane. We nailed it to the uh, tree right here. And for the last couple weeks, it's been on Welter's private beach property on the Oregon side of the Columbia. No one really paid much attention to it until a boater noticed it and called the U.S. Coast Guard to report a plane crash. The Coast Guard responded in full, even launching a helicopter to look for survivors. Later tweeting out, the search was called off after realizing the crash was old. I never thought anything would like this would happen. I know he's looking down and he's laughing about this and he's going, Chucky, what the heck did you do now? This one of a kind piece of yard art has added another chapter to its story. Near Rainier, Devin Haskins, KGW News. Not bad. Hey, let's talk some vaccines. We like to count these each and every night. More than 2.51 million Oregonians have gotten at least their first dose of the vaccine, according to the CDC. That works out to be 59.7% of the total population. So everybody, kids and adults, yes, I know kids under 12 aren't eligible to get the vaccine, but we want to give you an idea of the total population. How many people in the state are vaccinated out of the people who live here. In Washington, more than 4.77 million people have gotten at least their first dose. According to the CDC, that works out to be 62.7% of their state's population. All right, keep sending in questions and comments with the hashtag HeyDan. We'll address a few when we come back next.
Hey, uh, before we end on a Friday here, I, I do want to read an email I got from Steve, and it's a little bit of a pat on the back. I mean, come on, bear with me here. You humor me, all right? It says, hey, Dan, I'm going to bring up the Daytime Emmy Awards. Congratulations, by the way. So, Steve, thank you so much. I, I do want to say that our team at The Story recently did win a couple of Emmy Awards. It was last month. They were uh, regional Emmy Awards, as, as they call them. Um, it, it was some of our fire coverage, some of the other stuff that we did, and really I think it, we can thank all of you at home because all of the work that we do here is a reflection of the emails you send in and the, the things you want to see covered. But again, they, they were regional Emmys, that's what we call them in the news. Not a daytime Emmy, the daytime Emmys are for like, you know, soap operas and stuff like that. Although, you could imagine, can't you? I mean, we are pretty dramatic.